Chapter 12 This Enemy, They Wearing the outfit of a noble son, and with a dagger concealed in one boot, a suggestion from Dinan, Driss descended the wide stone stairway that led to Terbrek, the Academy of the Drow. Driss reached the top and moved between the giant pillars under the impassive gazes of two guards, last year's students of Mele Magnar. Two dozen other young drow milled about the academy compound, but Drist hardly noticed them. Three structures dominated his vision and his thoughts. To his left stood the pointed stalagmite tower of Sorcerer, the school of wizardry. Drist would spend the first six months of his tenth and last year of study in there. Before him, at the back of the level, loomed the most impressive structure, Arachtinolith, the school of law. Carved from the stone into the likeness of a giant spider, by drow reckoning, this was the academy's most important building and thus was normally reserved for females. Male students were housed within Arachtinolith only during their last six months of study. While Sorcerer and Arachtinolith were the more graceful structures, the most important building for Drist, at that tentative moment, lined the wall to his right, the pyramidal structure of Mele Magdare, the school of fighters. This building would be Drist's home for the next nine years. His companions, he now realized, were those other dark elves in the compound. Fighters, like himself, about to begin their formal training. The class, at twenty-five, was unusually large for the school of fighters. Even more unusual, several of the novice students were nobles. Just wondered how his skills would measure up against theirs. How his sessions with Zaknafane compared to the battles these others had no doubt fought with the weapons masters of their respective families. Those thoughts inevitably led Drizzt back to his last encounter with his mentor. He quickly dismissed the memories of that unpleasant duel, and, more pointedly, the disturbing questions Zack's observations had forced him to consider. There was no place for such doubts on this occasion. Mele Mag there loomed before him, the greatest test and the greatest lesson of his young life. My greetings, came a voice behind him. Drist turned to face a fellow novice who wore a sword and dirk uncomfortably on his belt, and who appeared even more nervous than Drist, a comforting sight. Kelnaz of House Canafin, 15th House, the novice said. Drist Doerden of Dermon Neshezbernon, House Doerden, 9th House of Menzo Berenzon, Drist replied automatically, exactly as Matron Mouse had instructed him. A noble, remarked Kelnaz. Understanding the significance of Drist bearing the same surname as his house, Kelnaz dropped into a low bow. I am honored by your presence. Drist was starting to like this place already. With the treatment he normally received at home, he hardly thought of himself as a noble. Any self-important notions that might have occurred to him at Kelnaz's gracious greeting were dispelled a moment later, though. When the masters came out, Drist saw his brother, Dinan, among them, but pretended, as Dinan had warned him to, not to notice, nor to expect any special treatment. Drist rushed inside Mele Mag there along with the rest of the students when the whips began to snap and the master started shouting of the dire consequences if they tarried. They were herded down a few side corridors and into an oval room. Sit or stand as you will, one of the masters growled, noticing two of the students whispering off to the side. The master took his whip out and crack took one of the offenders off his feet. Just couldn't believe how quickly the room then came to order. I am Hatchnit, the master began in a resounding voice. The master of law. This room will be your hall of instruction for 50 cycles of our bundle. He looked around at the adorned belts on every figure. You will bring no weapons to this place. Hatchnet paced the perimeter of the room, making certain that every eye followed his movements attentively. You are drow, he snapped suddenly. Do you understand what that means? Do you know where you come from, and the history of our people? Menzo Baranzan was not always our home, nor was any other cavern of the Underdark. Once we walked the surface of the world, he spun suddenly and came up right into Drist's face. Do you know of the surface? Master Hatchnet snarled. Drist recoiled and shook his head. An awful place, Hatchnet continued, turning back to the whole of the group. 
Each day, as the glow begins its rise in our bundle, a great ball of fire rises into the open sky above, bringing hours of light greater than the punishing spells of the priestesses of Loth. He held his arms outstretched with his eyes turned upward, and an unbelievable grimace spread across his face. Stoon's gasps rose up all about him. Even in the night when the ball of fire has gone below the far rim of the world, Hatchnik continued, weaving his words as if he were telling a horror tale. One cannot escape the uncounted terrors of the surface. Reminders of what the next day will bring, dots of light, and sometimes a lesser ball of silvery fire, mar the sky's blessed darkness. Once our people walked the surface of the world, he repeated, his tone now one of lament. In ages long past, even longer than the lines of the great houses, in that distant age, we walked beside the pale-skinned elves, the fairies. It cannot be true, one student cried from the side. Hatchnet looked at him earnestly, considering whether more would be gained by beating the student for his unasked-for interruption or by allowing the group to participate. It is, he replied, choosing the latter, of course. We thought the fairies our friends. We called them kin. We could not know in our innocence that they were the embodiment of deceit and evil. We could not know that they would turn on us so suddenly and drive us from them, slaughtering our children and the eldest of our race. Without mercy, the evil fairies pursued us across the surface world. Always we asked for peace, and always we were answered by swords and killing arrows. He paused, his face twisting into a widening, malicious smile. Then we found the goddess. Praise Loth! came one anonymous cry. Again, Hatchnet let the slip of tongue go by unpunished. Knowing that every assenting comment only drew his audience deeper into his web of rhetoric. Indeed, the master replied. All praise to the Spider Queen! It was she who took our orphaned race to her side and helped us fight off our enemies. It was she who guided the four matrons of our race to the paradise of the Underdark. It is she, he roared, a clenched fist rising into the air. Who now gives us the strength and the magic to pay back our enemies? We are drow! Hatchnik cried. You are drow, never again to be downtrodden, rulers of all you desire, conquerors of the lands you chose to inhabit. The surface? came a question. The surface! echoed Hatchnik with a laugh. Who would want to return to that vile place? Let the fairies have it. Let them burn under the fires of the open sky. We claim the Underdark, where we can feel the core of the world thrumming under our feet, and where the stones of the walls show the heat of the world's power. Driss sat silent, absorbing every word of the talented orator's often rehearsed speech. Driss was caught as were all the new students, in Hatchnet's hypnotic variations of inflections and rallying cries. Hatchnet had been the master of lore at the academy for more than two centuries, owning more prestige in Menzo Burns than the nearly any other male drow, and many of the females. The matrons of the ruling families understood well the value of his practiced tongue. So it went every day, an endless stream of hate rhetoric directed against an enemy that none of the students had ever seen. The surface elves were not the only target of Hatchnet sniping. Dwarves, gnomes, humans, halflings, all of the surface races, and even subterranean races such as the Duragar dwarves, which the drow often traded with and fought beside, each found an unpleasant spot in the master's ranting. Driss came to understand why no weapons were permitted in the oval chamber. When he left his lesson each day, he found his hands clenched by his sides in rage, unconsciously grasping for a scimitar hilt. It was obvious from the commonplace fights among the students that others felt the same way. Always, though, the overriding factor that kept some measure of control was the master's lie of the horrors of the outside world and the comforting bond of the students' common heritage. A heritage the students would soon come to believe that gave them enough enemies to battle beyond each other. The long, draining hours in the oval chamber left little time for the students to mingle. They shared common barracks, but their extensive duties outside of Hatchnet's lessons, serving the older students and masters, preparing meals, and cleaning the building, gave them barely enough time for rest. By the end of the first ten day, they walked on the edge of exhaustion, a condition, Driss realized, that only increased the stirring effects of Master Hatchnet's lessons. 
Drist accepted the existence stoically, considering it far better than the six years he had served his mother and sisters as page prince. Still, there was one great disappointment to Drist in his first ten days at Mele Magther. He found himself longing for his practice sessions. He sat on the edge of his bedroll late one night, holding a scimitar up before his shining eyes, remembering those many hours engaged in battle play with Zach Nafain. We go to lessons in two hours, Kalnaz in the next bunk reminded him. Get some rest. I feel the edge leaving my hands, Drist replied quietly. The blade feels heavier, unbalanced. The Grand Melee is barely ten cycles of Narbundle away, Kalnaz said. You will get all the practice you desire there. Fear not. Whatever edge has been dulled by the days with the Masters of Lore will soon be regained. For the next nine years, that fine blade of yours will rarely leave your hands. Driss slid the scimitar back into its scabbard and reclined on his bunk, as with so many aspects of his life so far. And, he was beginning to fear, with so many aspects of his future in Menzo Barons on, he had no choice but to accept the circumstances of his existence. This segment of your training is at an end, Master Hatchnet announced on the morning of the fiftieth day. Another Master Dinan entered the room, leading a magically suspended iron box filled with meagerly padded wooden poles of every length and design comparable to draw weapons. Choose the sparring pole that most resembles your own weapon of choice, Hatchnet explained as Dinan made his way around the room. He came to his brother, and Driss' eyes settled at once on his choice. Two slightly curving poles, about three and a half feet long. Driss lifted them out and put them through a simple cut. Their weight and balance closely resembled the scimitars that had become so familiar to his hands. For the pride of Demon Nishes Bernan, Dinan whispered, then moved along. Driss twirled the mock weapons again. It was time to measure the value of his sessions with Zack. Your class must have an order. Hatchnet was saying as Driz turned his attention beyond the scope of his new weapons. Thus the Grand Melee. Remember, there can be only one victor. Hatchnet and Dinan herded the students out of the Oval Chamber and out of Melee Mag there altogether, down the tunnel between the two Guardian Spider statues at the back of Tebrek. For all of the students, this was the first time they had ever been out of Menzo Baranzan. What are the rules? Driz asked Kelnaz, in line at his side. If a master calls you out, then you are out, Kelnaz replied. The rules of engagement, asked Drist. Kelnaz cast him an incredulous glance. Win, he said simply, as though there could be no other answer. A short time later, they came into a fairly large cavern. The arena for the Grand Melee, pointed stalactites leered down at them. From the ceiling and the stalagmite mounds broke the floor into a twisting maze filled with ambush holes and blind corners. Choose your strategies and find your starting point, Master Hatchnet said to them. The Grand Melee begins in a count of 100. The 25 students set off into action, some pausing to consider the landscape laid out before them, others sprinting off into the gloom of the maze. Driss decided to find a narrow corridor to ensure that he would fight off one against one, and he just started off in his search when he was grabbed from behind. A team? Kelnaz offered. Driss did not respond unsure of the other's fighting worth, and the accepted practices of this traditional encounter. Others are forming into teams, Elnaz pressed. Some in threes. Together we might have a chance. The master said there could be only one victor, Drist reasoned. Who better than you? If not me, Kelnaz replied with a sly wink. Let us defeat the others, then we can decide the issue between ourselves. The reasoning seemed prudent, and with Hatchnet's count already approaching seventy-five, Drist had little time to ponder the possibilities. He clapped Kelnaz on the shoulder and led his new ally into the maze. Catwalks had been constructed all around the room's perimeter, even crossing through the center of the chamber, to give the judging masters a good view of all of the action below. A dozen of them were up there now, all eagerly awaiting the first battle so that they might measure the talent of this young class. One hundred! cried Hatchnet from his high perch. Kelnaz began to move, but Driss stopped him, keeping him back in the narrow corridor between two long stalagmite mounds. Let them come to us, Driss signaled in the silent hand and facial expressions code. He crouched in battle readiness. Let them fight each other to wariness. Patience is our ally. Kelnaz relaxed, thinking he had made a good choice in Driss. 
Their patience was not tested severely, though. For a moment later, a tall and aggressive student burst into their defensive position, wielding a long spear-shaped pole. He came right in on Drist, slapping with the butt of his weapon, then spinning it over full in a brutal thrust design for a quick kill. A strong move perfectly executed. To Drist, though, it seemed the most basic of attack routines. Too basic. Almost. For Drist hardly believed that a trained student would attack another skilled fighter in such a straightforward manner. Drizzt convinced himself in time that this was indeed the chosen method of attack, and no feint, and he launched the proper parry. His scimitar pole spun counterclockwise in front of him, striking the thrusting spear in the succession and driving the weapon's tip harmlessly above the striking line of its wielder's shoulder. The aggressive attacker, stunned by the advanced parry, found himself open and off balance, barely a split second later before the attacker could even begin to recover. Drist's counter poked one, then the other scimitar pole into his chest. A soft blue light appeared on the stunned student's face, and he and Drist followed its line up to see a wand-wielding master looking down at them from the catwalk. You are defeated, the master said to the tall student. Fall where you stand. The student shot an angry glare at Drist and obediently dropped to the stone. Come, Drist said to Kelnas, casting a glance up at the master's revealing light. Any others in the area will know of our position now. We must seek a new defensible area. Kelnaz paused a moment to watch the graceful hunting strides of his comrade. He had indeed made a good choice in selecting Drist, but he knew already after only a single quick encounter that if he and his skilled swordsmen were the last two standing, a distinct possibility, he would have no chance at all of claiming victory. Together they rushed around a blind corner, right into two opponents. Kelnaz chased after one, who fled in fright, and Drist faced off against the other, who wielded sword and dirk poles. A wide smile of growing confidence crossed Drist's face as his opponent took the offensive, launching routines similarly basic to those of the spear wielder that Drist had easily dispatched. A few deft twists and turns of his scimitars, a few slaps on the inside edges of his opponent's weapons, had the sword and dirk flying wide. Drist's attack came right up the middle where he executed another double poke into his opponent's chest. The expected blue light appeared. You are defeated, came the master's call. Fall where you stand! Outraged, the stubborn student chopped viciously at Drist. Drist blocked with one weapon and snapped the other against his attacker's wrist, sending the sword pole flying to the floor. The attacker clenched his bruised wrist, but that was the least of his troubles. A blinding flash of lightning exploded from the observing master's wand, catching him full in the chest and hurtling him ten feet backward to crash into a stalagmite mound. He crumpled to the floor, groaning in agony, and a line of glowing heat rose from his scorched body, which lay against the cool gray stone. You are defeated, the master said again. Drist started to the fallen drow's aid, but the master issued an emphatic, No! Then Kelnaz was back at Drist's side. He got away! Kelnaz began, but he broke into a laugh when he saw the downed student. If a master calls you out, then you are out. Kelnaz repeated into Drist's blank stare. Come, Kelnaz continued. The battle is in full now. Let us find some fun. Drist thought his companion quite cocky for one who had yet to lift his weapons. He only shrugged and followed. Their next encounter was not so easy. They came into a double passage, turning in and out of several rock formations, and found themselves faced up against a group of three. Nobles from leading houses, both Drizzt and Kelmaz realized. Drizzt rushed the two on his left, both of whom wielded single swords, while Kelmaz worked to fend off the third. Drizzt had little experience against multiple opponents, but Zack had taught him the techniques of such a battle quite well. His movements were solely defensive at first. Then he settled into a comfortable rhythm and allowed his opponents to tire themselves out and to make the critical mistakes. These were cunning foes though, and familiar with each other's movements. Their attacks complemented each other, slicing in at Drist from widely opposing angles. Two hands, Zack had once called Drist, and now he lived up to the title, his scimitars working independently, yet in perfect harmony, foiling every attack. From a nearby perch on the catwalk, Masters Hatchnet and Dinan looked on, Hatchnet more than a little impressed, and Dinan swelling with pride. Drist saw the frustration mounting on his opponent's faces, and he knew that his opportunity to strike would soon be at hand. Then, they crossed up, coming in together with identical thrusts, their sword poles barely inches apart. Drist spun to the side and launched a blinding uppercut slice with his left scimitar, deflecting both attacks. Then he reversed his body's momentum, dropped to one knee, 
back in line with his opponents and thrust in low with two snaps of his free right arm. His jabbing scimitar pole caught the first and the second squarely in the groin. They dropped their weapons in unison, clutched their bruised parts, and slumped to their knees. Driss leapt up before them, trying to find the words for an apology. Hatchnet nodded his approval at Dinan as the two masters set their lights on the two losers. Help me! Kelnaz cried from beyond the dividing wall of stalagmites. Driss dived into a roll through a break in the wall, came up quickly and downed a fourth opponent who was concealed for a backstab surprise with a backhand chop to the chest. Driss stopped to consider his latest victim. He hadn't even consciously known that the drow was there, but his aim had been perfect. Hatchnet blew a low whistle as he shifted his light to the most recent loser's face. He is good, the master breathed. Driss saw Kelnaz a short distance away, practically forced down to his back by his opponent's skilled maneuvers. Driss leapt between the two and deflected an attack that surely would have finished Kelnaz. This newest opponent, wielding two sword poles, proved Driss' toughest challenge yet. He came at Driss with complicated feints and twists, forcing him on his heels more than once. Bergen Yon of House Benre, Hatchnet whispered to Dinan. Dinan understood the significance and hoped that his young brother was up to the test. Bergen Yon was not a disappointment to his distinguished kin. His moves came skilled and measured, and he and Driss danced about for many minutes with neither finding any advantage. The daring Burgignon then came in with an attack routine perhaps most familiar to Driss, the double thrust low. Driss executed the cross down to perfection, the appropriate parry as Acnefane had so pointedly proved to him. Never satisfied though, Driss then reacted on an impulse, agilely snapping a foot up between the hilts of his crossed blades and into his opponent's face. The stunned son of House Benray fell back against the wall. I knew the parry was wrong! Driss cried, already savoring the next time he would get the opportunity to foil the double thrust low in the session against Zack. He is good, Hatchnik gasped again to his glowing companion. Dazed, Bergignon could not find his way out of the disadvantage. He put a globe of darkness around himself, but Driss waded right in, more than willing to fight blindly. Driss put the son of House Ben Ray through a quick series of attacks ending with one of Driss' scimitar poles against Bergignon's exposed neck. I am defeated, the young Benry conceded, feeling the pole. Hearing the call, Master Hetchnet dispelled the darkness. Bergignon set both his weapons on the stone and slumped down, and the blue light appeared on his face. Driss couldn't hold back the widening grin. Were there any here that he could not defeat? He wondered. Driss then felt an explosion on the back of his head that dropped him to his knees. He managed to look back in time to see Kelnaz walking away. A fool! Hatchnet chuckled, putting his light on Driss, then turning his gaze upon Dinan. A good fool! Dinan crossed his arms in front of his chest, his face glowing brightly now in a flush of embarrassment and anger. Driss felt the cool stone against his cheek, but his only thoughts at that moment were rooted in the past, locked onto Zaknafane's sarcastic but painfully accurate statement. It is our way!